Good Friday and the Crucifixion Matthew 27, 1-50 Mark 15, 1-37 Luke 23, 1-46 John 18, 29-40 and 19, 1-30 Now, beloved one, I would speak with you about the Holy Week before Easter and the day you know as Good Friday, for you were touched by happenings in that Holy Week. You have come now into this point of focus, this lifetime, changed because of what occurred in that holy week and that holy day. You were present, and you have kept a memory with you throughout what you would see as a lineage of lifetimes. It has brought you to this place now of willingness to search, to remember who you are, the Christ incarnate, walking the face of the Holy Mother of the earth, interacting with the Holy Mother, interacting with all the energies upon this plane, interacting with the brothers and sisters, and knowing joy in the interaction no longer oppressed by the world. This was my message in that day and time, and it is a message which you have carried with you as a spark of remembrance, gently nudging you to search, to seek, to read, to study, discuss, to go to the ends of the earth, if it takes that, to find the Master who will ignite for you once again the remembrance. You have found that Master, and I do not speak of one Jeshua. I speak of the Master within you. You have found the Master within you which ignites the spark of remembrance, speaking softly yet persistently of the Christ which you are, guiding you through the experience of your Good Friday. In the very early hours of what has come to be known as Good Friday, I was brought before Pontius Pilate, the governor of the province, appointed by Rome to keep order in Jerusalem. It was a difficult task as there were many groups of people of varying beliefs and religious practice living in Jerusalem, and the scepter of world power weighed heavily on their minds and in their values. When I was brought before Pontius Pilate for judgment, the interaction between us touched his soul very deeply, and it affected all the other lifetimes which linearly he acted for himself. Every one who was there, seen and unseen, was touched. Pontius Pilate washed his hands of me quite literally. He washed his hands and said, Do what you need to do, but his blood will not be upon me. So the multitude in their ignorance, the high priest in their ignorance and in their divine wisdom said, We will accept the blood upon our hands. We will accept the responsibility for this. Pontius Pilate had tried to release me, for he knew that this was a time of celebration, the Passover, and there was a tradition of releasing a prisoner during that time. So he asked, Who would you have released? Now there is one who is a very well-known rabble-rouser, great energy, a man by the name of Barabbas. And Pilate said, Would you have me release this Yeshua, who has committed no crime as far as I can see, or Barabbas? And the multitude cried for Barabbas, Give us Barabbas! It is the way of the world, and the world had its way in that time. So Barabbas was released, much to his great astonishment, for he had already been making his plans for the hereafter, and I was given over to the soldiers once again, and the soldiers had great sport with me. It was the practice that before one was to be crucified, he would be scourged, beaten with whips. This was for the purpose of weakening the body so that the crucifixion, the time upon the cross until the deceasement of the body, did not take so long. So I was whipped and scourged. Now this was something that I knew how to withstand. I knew how to allow the body to be at a distance and not to feel the physical sensation. When I had studied with many of the masters in other lands, there had been trials, times of testing, when the body would be put through what could have been felt as great pain. And by practice, it didn't happen the first time, by practice, I knew how to disassociate myself from the sensation of the body. So I did this during the whipping, but the body itself suffered loss of blood. And when it came time to go to the place of the skull, Golgotha, to the place where the crucifixion would occur, I willed the body to carry the cross, and yet the body, being so weakened, could not support the cross. Now the cross, the cross was made of two great timbers nailed together, tall enough that the body of a six-foot man could easily be hung from it and still have room to spare from where the feet would be to where the earth and a good pit into the earth to support the beam would be. They did not put it in what you would see as six inches into the ground. It was in several feet of depth. The cross itself was sizable, rough hewn of timber, and it weighed a good bit. Imagine, if you will, how it would feel to carry, to drag, two great beams on a dirt path up a hill. I willed the body to do it, but yet it was not willing. And so one strong person by the name of Simon of Cyrene was forced by the soldiers to help me carry the cross. That one knew great love, that one willingly helped me, that one is and was my brother. 
that one had agreed, even before the incarnation of that lifetime, that he would be in that time and place in order to serve in that specific way. On the hill known as the place of the skull, the crosses were laid on the ground, and I was nailed to the cross with great heavy spikes. Not small nails, for indeed that would not support the weight of the man, but great heavy spikes, which made large holes in the hands and feet. Now, you have known crucifixion. You have known crucifixion emotionally in this lifetime and others, where you have felt yourself nailed to the cross. But more than that, you have known physical crucifixion. For when I speak to you of the great spike in the palm of the hand, what does it feel like? You can feel a sensation. What does it feel like to have a great spike driven in just below the ankle? What does that feel like? You can feel it. You have been there. I say this to you not to be gruesome. But I say this to you to allow you to know that you have experienced much more than just what is this path of focus, this lifetime, and you have come through physical crucifixion to this place of awareness now with great strength. For crucifixion did not cause you to cease being. The physical crucifixion, you deceased the body. Then what did you do? You turned around and made another body. Emotional crucifixion, they have not caused you to cease being. At that time, they felt like they were death itself. But they have not deceased you. Here you are, gaining strength from every crucifixion. With me upon the hill were two other being crucified, ones who had been caught in the act of thievery, ones who had been condemned to crucifixion. For the ones who they were robbing were highly placed, and they demanded the crucifixion penalty. These ones I saw as my brothers. I knew that they did not deserve the crucifixion, for crucifixion is the most painful way of deceasing the body. It is slow. It is torturous. One of the brothers on the cross asked of me, wanting, truly wanting, hoping that I could save him. If you are the Son of God, as you have said that you are, save yourself and us as well. It sounded like a taunt, but underlying it was the hope that perhaps, even at that moment, I could work a miracle and save all of us. And the brother on the other side of the cross next to me rebuked the first one and said, Do not say such a thing, for indeed we have gone against the rules and we have been caught. But this one is innocent. He has not done anything, and perhaps he will be a good word in with our Father. In other words, he didn't want to ruin his hopes for the afterlife. Perhaps I could do something. If I could not do it then on the cross, maybe afterwards I could help. And I said to them that even through the pain was so great, the physical pain, today truly you will be with me in paradise. You will know the freedom from physical pain, but more than that, you will know the freedom from the pain of the soul. Today you will be in paradise with me. The ones attending the crucifixion watched. It has been called a multitude, but I would not call it quite that. It was not the multitude which you have depicted upon the hillsides. It was a grouping, but this was early in the day. The crucifixion itself took place on what was the third hour of the morning, three hours after daybreak. As we were allowed to hang, suspended by the spikes, all three of us have been weakened by the scourging. All three of us have suffered some of the taunts, some of the comments. We were allowed to hang there in full view so that ones could witness our deceasement. I felt the energy of the ones so gathered, and it was a mixture of energy. Some saw it as a spectator sport, something to watch, entertainment perhaps, a diversion from the daily activity. Can you imagine such an attitude? It is hard for you to imagine that now, but I will say unto you that there have been lifetimes when you have found such sport to be a diversion, an entertainment, and did not feel any resonance, any affinity with the ones going through the experience. There was in that grouping a sense of power, ones who were reveling in the illusion of feeling power over other brothers. There was also much of a confusion, ones wondering how this could happen to a teacher or a rabbi, how this could happen to one who had called forth a brother from the dead. There were ones who were yet expecting the miracle, that even though I hung upon the cross, there would be a blaze of glory and I would come down from the cross in great light, great power, and a great miracle. And they awaited. They expected, they hoped, they wanted to see, they wanted to believe. And yet there was a great fear in them, that if someone as powerful as they saw me to be, someone as powerful as they believed me to be, could be upon that cross seemingly gradually deceasing the body, what was going to happen to them? And there was a great feeling of fear rampant, and I could feel all of these emotions. I could feel also the love of ones who had followed me, ones who knew me as a son, for indeed my mother was there, ones who knew me as a brother, as a friend, a companion. I could feel their love and their bewilderment. I could feel all the human emotions, and there was great intensity of confusion. And I spoke to my father. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
the ones who were feeling that there was a power, temporary power, the ones who were feeling that it was a great entertainment and did not feel oneness with what was going on. I spoke to my father to comfort the ones who were anticipating loss, the ones who were bewildered. Father, forgive them. Give them a sense of knowing the holy vision. Allow them to know your love once again. I spoke to my mother. I spoke to the disciple known as John. In the society of that day and time, a woman to be left alone, for indeed my earthly father Joseph had already deceased. A woman needed someone to do the things of law for her in society. So I spoke to the disciple known as John to behold his mother, and I spoke to my mother to behold her son, so that he would accept my mother as his mother and look after her, and so that she would accept John as her son and would know that he would care for her and look out for her. Then as time went on, I wanted to remind all of those so gathered at the prophecies, I wanted to remind them that what was going on was sacred, it was holy. It was not just an event of entertainment, a passing event. It was not just a political event, but it was a time of great import, a time of spiritual remembrance. So I called out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani, which translated means, My God, my God, why hast you forsaken me? All of you have known that feeling. All of you have come to the dark night of the soul, where you have lain perhaps at night in darkness, the physical darkness of your room, and you have listened to the voice of the world, to the voice of the ego, to the voice even of the body which has spoken to you that perhaps this challenge which you are facing was going to be too great, and you have called out for your father, for God, for an angel, for someone. And in your turmoil, in your sadness, in your confusion, you have not heard an answer, and you had felt forsaken. Because you have been so caught up in your turmoil and your confusion, there has not been the opportunity provided by peace to hear the still small voice of the Father. Did I feel in that moment that I had been forsaken by my Father? No, I did not. I have known always that I am one with my Father. I have known always that I am that I am. That is what it means to know oneness with the Father. It is no great complexity. I am that I am. I am. I am alive. I am conscious. I am energy. The Father is the isness of that which I am. I did not feel abandoned by my Father forsaken, but it was to remind all the ones who would hear, all the ones who would record for generations upon generation, it was to remind you of the writing of a certain song of David which prophesies the fulfillment of Scripture. For if you will go to what is numbered now in your Scriptures as the twenty-second Psalm, and you will read, you will see prophesied what I experienced in the day known as the Holy Friday. So I cried out, beginning to recite the Scripture so that all could hear and all could remember that it had been foretold. Some thought that I cried out in great pain, pain of my soul that I felt forsaken. Some thought that I cried out to Elias to come and save me. But it was to remind you of the song of David which set out in great detail and symbolism that which I experienced on Good Friday. After a certain length of time, I knew that the body was becoming weak enough that the deceasement would be easy. And I said, I thirst. Now, I did not thirst in the physical way. Already the vinegar with the painkiller had been offered to me, for ones knew that the crucifixion is a slow and torturous way of deceasing the body, and it was offered to ones being crucified that they could drink of the sponge that contained a bitter vinegar with a painkiller in it to ease some of the pain. I had refused that previously. I did not need it. I did not refuse it out of great macho-ness. I refused it because I did not need it. But when I said I thirst... It was to speak that I thirst to know once again the oneness, the harmony, the peace, the love, the allness, the healing of my soul, the communion of my soul with all that is. I thirst to drink from the fountain which is eternally nourishing the soul. That is what I meant. But one of the soldiers came and offered me the sour vinegar once again, and I took at that time to please him, and I spoke that. It is finished, for I knew that the demonstration then was quite visible. The crowd had been gathered for another good three hours, in fact, more than that. It had been six hours that we had been upon the cross, and from the time of the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was a gathering darkness upon the face of our Holy Mother the earth. And in the ninth hour I knew that the body was sufficiently weakened that I could be deceased, and I said, It is finished. When I have set out to do in this portion of this lifetime is completed, and I said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
In other words, Father, here I come with all of my consciousness once again into your presence. Into your hands, symbolically, and into the awareness of your presence, I commend my spirit. And I decease the body for all to see. For there had to be no doubt that the body had suffered, that the body had gone through the physical weakening, and the body was deceased. The happenings on the day known as Good Friday are symbolic of your journey. It is a journey which you have made throughout many lifetimes. And as you will read your scripture of what occurred on that day, and you will look for deeper meaning, you will find that it is a description of your journey even in this day and time. And what will come as the next chapter in your story? The next chapter is known as your Easter. It also is symbolic of your journey. For in truth you stand upon the threshold of your own Easter. You stand upon the threshold of your conscious awareness that you are not held by any worldly belief upon any cross of the world's making. You cannot be contained within a tomb of the world's making. Then you come to the place of a full realization of the Christ which you are, incarnate, powerful love expressing. Beloved and holy child of the Father, it is finished. Today you are with me in paradise.